Well, he's risen. He is risen indeed. Yes, he has. And, uh, you know, this is, this is the greatest day for us. There's no greater day to celebrate than the resurrection of our Lord. I love Christmas, and I love the birth of Jesus, but that holds no light, no comparison to this day of our risen Savior. And uh, we should be joyful. This should be a super day of celebration for all of us as Christians. And we do that because we have the resurrection hope. Now, I hope my finger's not too distracted. I'm not really shaking it in any way, but it might really feel like I am. I'm not, so. uh, the Lord is good, and uh, I love His Word. And uh, this week, as I was preparing for today, lot's been on my mind, and uh, we're going to be in Luke chapter 24. I decided to do the little rendition of the resurrection with the, the kids. I thought that was such a great little clip, uh, especially Peter. Res Rooster's crowing? What? I, I, it doesn't make... Uh, I don't remember that. <laughs> so it's just really, really cute. Because I wanted to go to, to a resurrection story that, uh, that we hear often, but maybe not on Resurrection Sunday. And that is the road to Emmaus. And this is such a great resurrection story that I just wanted to kind of really soak there. But I, I want you to think with me a little bit. Have you ever been a part of something and, and in the end it felt like it just really flopped? I mean, it just, in your mind, it just bombed. And, and do you recall that feeling? That walking away from whatever you've been involved with, especially if you just really poured a whole lot of time and an effort into it, and energy expended, you just you, you feel kind of wow, hmm, sad. I don't know. There's a whole lot of feelings I guess people feel in those moments. Now, you might even feel angry, like man, I put all that stinking time in, and look what it got me, nothing, right? I, I don't know, have you been there? Am I the only one? No, I don't think so. Um, well, you get that feeling that these two disciples walking to Emmaus, they're bummed out. Man, they're discouraged. They're having a hard time because, I mean, they poured three years into this movement. What they thought was going to be the Messiah coming. And they were bummed. I mean, they're headed home. Their heads are dragging in the dirt. I mean, I mean, they got to walk seven miles, which, hey, seven miles is no, you know, no, yeah, walk in the park. But I would imagine for them, as they are walking along, that seven miles turned into a hundred miles. I can imagine them just kind of walking along, talking, fueling each other's sorrows and I mean can you see it they're just oh it's just you know what are we gonna do how about you what are you going to do as you journey with Christ as you walk along and there are moments in our journey where where we become discouraged as Christians where we see what we've tried to do in ministry may not have panned out like we'd hoped. We struggle. Maybe we're in conflict with each other. Maybe we're, we're looking at each other in the room and we're like, oh, I really don't want to be here. What do we do in those moments where, where we're dragging our heads and our feet and, and we're lamenting the sorrow? Of what didn't happen. What do we do? Well, let's read the scripture. And let's hear what the scripture has for us. Because I think it will shed light. To what we need to do in those moments. What we need to do in the moments when, when we need the resurrection Lord. To walk along silence. read Luke chapter 24 starting at verse 13 
Now that same day, two of them were going to the village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about, about everything that had happened. As they walked and discussed these things with each other, could you imagine that conversation? I mean, it had to be a boo-hoo moment. I mean, it was just boo-hoo. And, and they're fueling each other. You know it is. Uh, well, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. They asked them, he asked them, why, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast, and one of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? Jesus has such great humor. <laughs> what things? <laughs> About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and their rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death. And, and can you imagine the buildup? I mean, the anger's coming all back, don't you think? I mean, they're really getting fired up because this person doesn't know what happened. Oh, man, how could that be? But he hoped that he, but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. There it is. And what is more is that the third day since all this took place, in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but did not find his body. They came and told us what they'd seen, a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him, but him they did not see. He said to them, Jesus said to them, How foolish are you, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Did not Christ have to suffer these things and enter to enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning him. Now that is a history lesson to sit in on. As they approached the village to, to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us for it is nearly evening. The day is almost here. So he went in and sat with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were open and they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. How rude. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us? While he was talking with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us, they got up and returned to Jerusalem. They, there they found the eleven with those of them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Father, may we not be dragging our feet today. May we not be so concerned about what hasn't happened that we forget that you have risen. May we look to you and, and may our eyes be open. May we receive the resurrection. Father, as we break the bread, coming up may it just be a symbol of the resurrection hope that your son Jesus has brought to us we are so thankful for this opportunity to celebrate to come and to to think about your word to apply it to our lives and to open our lives to you and to live it out in such a deep way we 
give thanks. In Jesus' name. Amen. This is not to be a downer. But we know that in life, struggles come. We know disappointments come. We know that that's just kind of a part of life. In fact, Scripture will tell us that the suffering as a Christian is a part of the journey. And we'll hit it. We do. And, and it may not come all the time, but it comes. And we know it. And so how do we prepare ourselves? Well, I think this gives us a picture. A picture of a couple things that we can really digest because of the resurrection of Jesus. First of all, it's okay to feel down. It's okay to feel disappointed. Jesus didn't really rebuke that they were down and out. He rebuked them because they failed to go back to what they were taught, the scriptures. Jesus brought them back. To the scripture. See, I think that's us too sometimes. We, we get down and out in our circumstances and, and we can. And we are okay with disappointments. But what we fail to do sometimes is to go back to where we need to go back to. And that's scripture. Because it is scripture that Jesus leads them through that helps them get over the disappointment. Now, I want to caveat that with When Jesus leads you through Scripture, powerful things happen. We may not always feel that when we're leading each other through Scripture. But when we are focused on Jesus, the resurrection life, leading us through His Scripture, I guarantee you, powerful things will happen in your life. Just as it happened to these two disciples. Walking along, disappointed. And Jesus in his own way. And I, I can't wait to really experience that with Jesus. The walking with him. I mean, we have that now with the Spirit. But I mean, that physical con uh, connection with Jesus as we're walking with him. Talking with him. Are you slow to heart? To believe. See, Jesus wanted them to know that his word is worthy. His writing of the prophets, of using the prophets and down through the history and the scripture is worthy because when we're down and out, that's what's going to lift us up and point us to the resurrection of Jesus. Our resurrection hope. Everything leads up through the prophets to that moment. We experienced that on Thursday night with the Seder meal. How, how that meal, the Passover, and all that we experienced is really pointing to one thing. The resurrection of Jesus. And that's where we go back to. Our hope is in the resurrection. And beginning with Moses, the scripture says, and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning him. I don't know about you, but it takes me a while to get through this whole thing. And that's good. Because that means there's a lot here to be said about Jesus. And that is going to sustain me. That is going to lead me. That is going to lead us. This right here, as we work with it together, as we read and as we wrestle with the Word and as we see God moving us to the different parts of Scripture as He does so, so elegantly. So I just say, when you're down and out, go to the Scriptures because it is there you will meet the resurrection of God. Jesus. Will come and walk along with you. Secondly, I think that helps us 
in those moments when we know we're struggling, is the fellowship of each other. Jesus came. He sat at the table with them. In the Jewish culture, it is, it, it is a hospitality culture, if you will. I mean, it would be a great offense if they did not open their doors to the stranger and allow them to come in and sit with them and feed them and, and, and meet their needs. And that's what these two did. They're, they urged Jesus to come in because they knew it was proper to have fellowship with each other. And it was there that Jesus was able to really intimately connect with them. We need that with each other, right? As we met today downstairs with breakfast, it was good. We fellowship together. We connected with each other in a special way that really we don't do if you're not eating together. So the moral of the story, let's eat more. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but there is something to be said about us gathering together, fellowshipping, living life together. Because we connect with each other. We hear each other's stories. We know how to pray for each other. I don't have to sit here and say, this is what you need to pray about in my life for me. But as I'm talking with you, you hear my story unfold. And, and you probably catch on. Hey, that's probably something I could pray about for them. But if we don't meet together, we don't have those opportunities together to do those things. Jesus wants them to discover his word in a deep way, but he wants them to gather together in fellowship. Eat with each other. Journey life with each other. As he sat at the table with them, I think it was just natural for Jesus just to kind of take the reins in these moments. He took the bread gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then, then their eyes were open to who he was. I don't know about you, but I know that Scripture just doesn't put things in there in context at a whim. This isn't a filler statement. To complete the story somehow, so it's a well-rounded story. Think about it. The moment that Jesus breaks the bread and gives it to them and their eyes recognize who he is, are you catching the symbolicness of that moment? If you were here Thursday night, I don't know about you, but I don't think I will ever use anything but matzo bread for you. <laughs> In the Passover, the Jewish people use matzah bread. It's unleavened bread. But what was significant for me was that we learned that they intentionally pierce the bread. Does that sound familiar to you? <coughs> Prophet Isaiah prophesied that he would be pierced for our transgressions. And then they, they intentionally make sure that there is a stripe pattern to the matzah bread. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Zechariah prophes prophesied, by his stripes we shall be healed. Whoa. And Jesus, for those guys, took the bread. He broke it. And he gave it to them. And their eyes were open. This isn't a dead Lord that broke the bread. This is the risen hope for all of us. And we do this with each other to remind ourselves of our risen Savior. 
Yes, it's the body that was broken for us. And yes, this is the new covenant, the blood that was shed for us. But these aren't dead elements. These are alive elements because our Lord has risen. These gentlemen experienced firsthand Jesus breaking that bread. What a special moment. Can you imagine? I hope, I hope, I pray that when we get to heaven, we'll have communion with God for the, for the time that we spend with Him in eternity. I, know, I, know, I don't know if that's even correct, but I just think, wow, wouldn't that be something to see Jesus break the bread? past the cup. We don't really have to remember what he did because we'll be in glory with him, but what a still special moment. I think Hebrews chapter 1 helps us in a lot of ways with scripture like this. So Brandon, would you go ahead and hit the space bar once? So Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to, to our fathers by the prophets. Go ahead and hit the space bar again. But in those last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed to, to heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God. I love that. It's worth reading again. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. And He upholds the universe by the words, by the word of His power. After making purification of for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. having become as much superior to the angel as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Again, he is the author of resurrection hope and all that we look to. The exact representation of God's nature. The exact. There is no other representation other than Jesus. I want you to hear this song and at the end of it I want us to take communion. If you would come and, and I'll hold the elements and you could just break off a piece of the matzo bread and dip it into the cup and then partake. Remembering that the bread, as Jesus broke it that night, said, this is my body that was broken for you. And then he took that cup and he said, this is the new covenant, the, the blood that was shed for sin. His blood for us. So that we could experience resurrection Sunday with hope and life. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's watch this song and listen to the words, if you would. <laughs> 